At 3.30 a.m. on the 31st of August, 1888, Charles Cross was passing through Bucks Row in Whitechapel, east of London, on his way to work as a delivery driver when he came across a strange figure lying on the other side of the street. He moved closer to get a better look and was immediately taken aback by what he saw. It was the body of a woman sprawled on the floor. She was barely breathing and her skirt was raised above her waist. He did not know what to do in that instance, so he just pulled her skirt down and headed to work with the intention of informing any policeman he saw about the discovery. Shortly after he left the scene, police officer John Neal arrived there. He switched on a lantern to examine the body and discovered blood oozing out of the woman's throat from two slash wounds. She was stabbed twice in the vagina and the abdomen, with her intestines gutted out. A Dr. Llewellyn arrived at 4 a.m. to examine the body and determined she had been dead for about 30 minutes. People working nearby claimed they didn't hear any noise that could have alarmed them of the murder happening just feet away. Also, little blood was found on the scene despite the severity of the mutilations. So, Dr. Llewellyn believed the murder occurred somewhere else, and the body was dumped at the scene. However, the coroner dismissed Llewellyn's claims and stated that the woman was killed wherever she was found, but her clothes had soaked up the majority of the blood. The following day, the deceased was identified as Mary Ann Nichols, who was staying in a motel at 18 Thrall Street, Spitalfields. Nichols' murder was just the beginning of the terror unleashed on residents of Whitechapel by the murderer, who would later be identified by the pseudonym Jack the Ripper. The world has seen numerous vicious serial killers since Jack the Ripper, but his crimes generated far more disdain and outcry from the public because of the police's inability to uncover his identity. Even after a century, Jack the Ripper's identity has remained a mystery. Today's video will review everything about this serial killer, his modus operandi, gruesome details of murders he committed, and individuals suspected to be the mysterious Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper, also known as the White Chapel Murderer and Leather Apron, was an anonymous serial killer who operated in the slums of Whitechapel, England between August and November of 1888. He was believed to have had a substantial knowledge of human anatomy because of the precise and calculated mutilations he performed on his victims. He targeted women from the poor areas of Whitechapel, slit his victims' throats, performed genital and abdominal mutilations on the women, and removed their internal organs. Some of the organs he left on the scene, while others were missing, suspected to have been kept as a trophy by the murderer. There were speculations that he had committed at least 12 murders, but due to the numerous killings in the area during that time, the police could only ascertain five victims, who were called the Canonical Five. The canonical five were Marianne Nichols, who was found dead on the 31st of August, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly. When the murders occurred, the police constantly received taunting letters from someone claiming to be the killer. This individual would give gruesome details of the murders, and also include hints on more murders to come. Authorities once received a letter and attached to it was half of a kidney, believed to have been removed from one of the victims. At 6 a.m. on the 8th of September, the second of the canonical five was discovered at 29 Hanbury Street, Spitalfields. Her throat had been slit wide open with a knife. Her abdomen had been cut open as well, with part of the skin severed and placed on her left shoulder. A piece of flesh from another body part and her small intestines were hung on her right shoulder. Autopsy results revealed that her uterus, vagina, and bladder had been removed. The victim was later identified as Annie Chapman, who an eyewitness, Elizabeth Long, claimed to have seen on the street at 5.30am, conversing with a dark-haired man 
dressed in a black overcoat and a brown hat. However, Long could not give a distinct description of the man she had reportedly seen the victim with. The following two victims were murdered on the same day of September 30th. Elizabeth Stride's body was found at 1 a.m. in Dutfield's yard, Burner Street in Whitechapel. Her throat was slit six inches across the neck, cutting her carotid artery and trachea before cutting through her jaw. Unlike the previous victims, her body was neither mutilated nor injured. This event indicated that the murderer was interrupted before he could complete his assault on the body, meaning someone came close to catching him. Several people claimed to have seen the victim with a man close to Burner Street earlier that morning, but the eyewitnesses' descriptions of the man clashed. The contradictions rendered the accounts unusable. Catherine Eddowes was also discovered on the 30th of September at Meter Square in London. Her throat had been slit like the other victims, her abdomen was cut open, and her intestines were extracted and placed over her right shoulder. The victim's kidney and uterus were also removed, but missing from the scene. She had also sustained a gash across the face running down the eyes, nose, and cheek. A triangular shape was carved into her cheek, and her right earlobe was found in her clothes. The last of the canonical five was Mary Jane Kelly, whom people claimed used to solicit on the streets in Whitechapel. Her body was found in her bed at 13 Miller's Court, Spitalfields, on the 9th of November. Kelly's murder seemed the most gruesome of all, as her face was disfigured beyond recognition and her body was taken apart. Her throat was severed and her abdomen was cut open, emptying it of all her organs. Her extracted uterus and kidney, along one of her breasts, were placed under her head. Her thighs and a part of the skin from her abdomen were found on the bedside table. The victim's heart was missing, probably kept as a souvenir by the killer. Mary Jane Kelly was arguably Jack the Ripper's last victim. Even though police were never able to catch this slippery serial killer, they performed extensive investigations, producing over 100 suspects, many of which were merely based on speculation. Three of these suspects have remained imprinted in people's minds, probably because they seem to be the most feasible of all the suspects. Montague Druitt was the prime suspect during that time because his occupation and interest aligned with that of Jack the Ripper. Druitt was a barrister who also worked as an assistant schoolmaster to rake in additional income. Jack the Ripper murdered his victims during weekends, indicating that he might have been a working class member. Druitt also had a unique interest in medical surgery. Remember, Jack the Ripper was believed to have intricate knowledge of human anatomy. Druitt was mentally ill, so he was dismissed from his job. He disappeared thereafter, and this time coincided with the months of the murder. He was found dead on the 31st of December, 1888, in the Thames River after he had committed suicide by drowning. No murder following his death fitted Jack the Ripper's traits. The modern-day primary suspect is Aaron Kosminski, a 23-year-old Polish barber who emigrated to Whitechapel just before the murders began. He possessed medical knowledge since his father worked at a hospital. Detectives claimed Kosminski had an intense hatred toward women and found it difficult to socialize with the female gender. He was so deprived of female company that he had allegedly gone insane from too many years of solitary vices. According to the testimony given by Elizabeth Long, the man she had seen conversing with Chapman had a foreign accent and Kosminski had a thick Polish accent. In 2014, DNA from his living relatives was tested with DNA on a shawl claimed to have been retrieved from the murder scene of the fourth victim and it came back as a match. The last of the three suspects is John Pizer, a bootmaker in Whitechapel during the time, earning him the nickname 
leather apron, just like the serial killer. He had been convicted for stabbing someone and had a history of assaulting prostitutes. He was arrested on the 10th of September 1888 for the murders despite the absence of any concrete evidence against him. Due to there being no DNA testing at the time, police chose their suspect based majorly on hunches rather than solid evidence, so people easily point out holes in their theories. Let us look at some of these points that question the viability of these individuals as suspects. Jack the Ripper knew the ins and outs of Whitechapel so well that authorities were convinced he was a resident of the area. Druitt, on the other hand, lived at the Thames in Kent, where he finally ended his life. The only evidence the police had tying him to the murders was the coincidental time frame of his disappearance with the killings. According to records from the mental asylum Kosminski was admitted to, he had more tendency to self-harm than commit homicide, and never exhibited signs of violence during his stay at the asylum. The DNA results linking him to the fourth murder have since been invalidated on several grounds. The fourth victim, Catherine Eddowes, was really poor and allegedly prostituted, meaning it was unlikely that she could have afforded a shawl at that time. Even if the shawl belonged to her, it had been passed around from hand to hand since over 100 years ago, and the DNA would have been contaminated. In addition, the shawl was never mentioned in the police report of the case. Lastly, John Pizer had airtight alibis for two of the murders as he stayed with relatives during one and was in the company of a police officer during the second one. Further proving his innocence, he was awarded compensation from a newspaper company that named him the serial killer. To date, no one has been definitely identified as the notorious Jack the Ripper. Nevertheless, weighing the theories and invalidations, who among these individuals do you consider the most viable? We would like to hear your view in the comment section. Thank you for watching and we hope you enjoyed the video. Please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Likewise, turn on notifications so you never miss a video.